We're now going to move to comments, short comments from uh, an excellent panel of five individuals. I'm going to proceed from my right directly over to the left. There is a logic in that uh, order. Uh, so we'll start out with George Vasconcelos, then move to Karsten Newhoff. You can all look in your programs for their introduction, uh, more information about them rather than for me to take time on introducing them. Then to Carlos Spotley, Ronnie Bellmans, and by this point you will have noticed there's sort of preponderance of electricity people here. Uh, so we're going to give the final word to Simon Blakey, special envoy from Eurogas, to talk about that aspect of climate policy as well. And then we will open the floor uh, to questions and discussion. So, George, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Danny. Good morning. Uh, well, we heard two excellent presentations. Uh, uh, Carlo Carraro recalled us the scientific evidence about some of the risks we face, and climate risks in particular. He identified alternative policies and he, he showed that uh, we can choose between um, several adaptation and mitigation strategies. And Josel Beck uh, continued uh, on that and uh, told us that we know how to face these challenges, we, we know uh, how to implement these strategies. Indeed, we have targets in the European Union and we even have some necessary instruments to implement the targets and to achieve our goals. And I agree with, uh, with both, but uh, I have three buts. Before I, I go to, to the, these three buts, I'd like to talk about the but, and just to reflect uh, with you about uh, what we heard yesterday. And those of you who were here yesterday and had the opportunity to listen to some of our uh, top politicians in Europe, in particular to Mr. Barroso, Mr. Monti, and Mr. Solana, I'm sure that you noticed the very refreshing um, novelty that they all were exercising self-criticism, that they all were identifying mistakes and omissions uh, by the European institutions, by the Council, by the Commission, by the Member States. And uh, I think this is very uh, refreshing and uh, extremely helpful uh, because uh, until some years ago that uh, would have not been possible. It was not politically correct to challenge the wisdom of the Council, of the Commission, of the Parliament, of the European institutions. Uh, so now we are free to do that in a constructive way, and uh, I think that's the, the way we should go to build um, better Europe. And because there are so many young researchers in this room, I can only uh, underline the importance of criticism and self-criticism to advance things in politics and in science, of course. Now, let's talk about my three buts. The first one is uh, something that, in fact, uh, Carlo has uh, explicitly mentioned. Uh, the problems we face cannot be solved by Europe alone. We depend on the behavior of other uh, countries, of other regions of the world. And uh, I would like to connect this statement with uh, what one of the wise men of the previous panel, Pippo Ranchi, said that uh, we cannot ignore the issue of uh, energy excess. And of course, energy excess and, um, and, and climate change uh, are, are related. And this has not only an economic dimension, that was, I guess, uh, people's point, this has other dimensions. This has political and ethical dimensions that we should uh, not forget when designing and implementing our policies. The second but is um, the question which uh, just uh, dropped at the end of his presentation, whether these mitigation and adaptation measures we have identified are compatible with energy markets, in particular with the electricity market in Europe. And this leads us immediately to another question, to my third question, then I will come back to the second. Uh, the third question uh, is deriving from this one, is whether we have a market, whether we have an internal European energy market. And that was, of course, the, the topic of the previous panel, 
uh, I, uh, I listed carefully to all the very interesting statements that were made, and I would say that, uh, yes, probably we will have uh, an internal energy market by 2014 or 15. Um, it will be, um, well, uh, very close to uh, what we consider to be uh, a proper European energy market. Um, I think we also learned from the previous panel that a lot has been achieved. Uh, there are no perfect markets, but we have learned a lot. And I think that especially we have learned a lot about uh, the creation of markets, the creation of different industry cultures. We clearly saw that we have now different uh, industries within the energy industry. I'm not, to not only talking about electricity and gas, but even within electricity, we have the generators culture, we have the TSOs culture, and we have the DSOs culture at least. And this is also something that we have been building over the, the last years, and that's a hell of a change. And uh, above all, we learned how to cooperate uh, on the design, on the implementation, and on the fine-tuning of energy markets. So, third question, uh, we don't have yet uh, a well-functioning integrated European market, but we will probably have it soon. Now, let's come back to the second, but to the previous question, which was whether the mitigation adaptation uh, measures are compatible with uh, energy markets. And, and if it is implicitly in this question with the market, with the European market, with the model we have been implementing and we are trying to accomplish by 2014. And, um, <clears throat> well, uh, I think that uh, Claude uh, Mandil addressed this question explicitly in his final statement. And uh, another of the wise men in the previous panel, uh, David Newberry, with that extraordinary British understatement, just dropped it, a small, devastating question at the very end of his magnificent presentation. He asked it whether that thing that we were building uh, and, and he was analyzing was really what we need for the future, whether it is really the market model compatible with our climate change policies. And uh, I think that the implicit answer uh, was no. And uh, we, we are all aware that we need to reinvent, to redesign the energy markets. We need a market compatible with our climate change policies. George, and we uh, need a design for a market compatible climate change policy. And I have to finish. I will finish here. But I think this is the challenge for, again, for the young researchers in the room and for the Florence School of Regulation and for Jean-Michel Glachin. Thank you, George. Karsten Neuhoff, next. Bringing this back to the question of State of the Union, why Europe in the session on the climate policy? And, um, I would come up with three aspects. One is, if we are to integrate larger shares of renewable, I think there is a lot of value in this European energy market. In terms of balancing intraday, in terms of providing the flexibility across Europe, and I share your point at the end, I think we are still quite a way to go if we look in terms of where we are with the processes right now and framework guidelines and grid codes. We are, I think, on good track, but I think we quickly have to act a lot quicker as well to make sure that we have the level of flexibility in the system use that is technically the system on the market side to really integrate the European energy market to provide um, the sharing across areas. Secondly, resource sharing. As we use more renewable resources, I think we will make see more benefits of really using the different resources in different European countries. There again, in the Renewables Directive, we have the flexibility mechanisms. I think we will not necessarily need them this decade, but if we don't start to using them to build up the experience how to use them, we will struggle to really use them at larger scale in the next decade. And I think that's another emphasis that we should really uh, put upon. And the third dimension for me where I've seen the most benefit of European policy was the level of commitment. Um, President Barroso yesterday pointed out this difficulty of political periods of 
four years effectively, two years of operation. And I think we've been quite effective in Europe where we used European institutions to provide a longer term commitment, which then either kind of lasted over several periods and or provided a motivation for national governments then to implement something that is difficult, easy to commit to in a longer term, but sometimes quite tough to do in a shorter term. I think that is an effective and a very valuable thing on the European scale that we need to use more, and particularly in the dimension of climate change, I think quite crucial. Particularly it's crucial, and that comes to my second point, investment. Yesterday there was a lot of discussion on investment. I think the tricky part on investment is how do you attract private investors in taking forward this investment because ultimately they are looking for business plans. And I think that's where we've got a set of investment policies in place that we need to take forward. Otherwise, I would assume we don't have a large increase of power demand in Europe over the next decade as we don't have a large increase of cement demand in Europe. And we've seen most cement, European cement companies investing in other regions of the world rather than in Europe. So unless we have a framework that suggests we are looking for different products, I don't see how we have large scale of private investment in Europe. And so the two aspects that we have is climate change, where the ETS directive of a shorter and midterm and the European climate targets, I think are crucial. And the targets in a way get their credibility from today's policy. And I think that's where I certainly support your approach to say we have to revisit ETS at the moment because we see carbon prices which are just too low to really make demonstrated credible commitment to the ETS system. We have clear reasons why they are so low. I would add one to the discussion. We assumed when we designed ETS, implemented ETS, that one can have unlimited amount of banking. But ultimately, we'll be having over the next two years about 2.5 to 2.7 gigatons more CO2 allowances in the system than we actually have demand for these allowances. And so we need to bank them. Only about half of that will be banked by utilities that hedge future power sales. For the rest, we in large require private speculative investors to buy them. And they take returns, certainly under current circumstances, exceeding 10 to 15%, which implies current prices will remain really low compared to future prices or expectations about future prices, unless with this auctioning, shifting, or set aside, I think we take about, about 1.4 gigatons as it was initially proposed. If we don't do this, I struggle to see how the carbon price would demonstrate the commitment we have in Europe going forward. Secondly, it's the Renewables Directive, and again, I think it has been quite effective, not only in terms of providing specific incentives for projects, which national schemes can do. We can have a feed-in tariff that gives you a guarantee for your project for 20 years. But what about the business model of project developers? What about the supply chain? How can we com commit that in two, three, four, or seven years, we will continue to have this demand which makes it valuable to invest in innovation and production capacity? I think that's something where the European framework, the European Renewables Directive was very valuable. And to the question which was brought up about beyond 2020, I would argue we will continue to need some type of renewable target beyond this one. Because um, renewable energy is different from vacuum cleaners that you brought up earlier on. I think if you have a new innovative vacuum cleaner and you have 5% of the market share, you'll be able to capture the rest of the market because your company can kind of just expand. The energy sector, you are bound to the network, you are bound to market design, you are bound to a set of constraints that will make it really difficult to take this forward unless coordination frameworks are in place to facilitate the growth of this technology unless these frameworks either push incumbents to change their strategy or facilitate new entrants to take forward this. And that's why I think where we need the renewable targets beyond 2020 because we need than beyond the initial 20-30% of market share to maintain the opportunity to shift to new technologies. Which brings me to the final point, energy costs. I would argue we are lucky at the moment that energy costs are actually lower due to climate policy because renewables are pushing in the market, are pushing out gas at the margin. So currently we see lower prices. In the midterm, I would argue it's financing costs where clear, simple schemes which ex um, are similar across European countries, therefore attractive for investors, but clear commitments by national governments, therefore allowing for low-cost finance are crucial. Feed-in tariffs are a core part of this and will stay for a while. But the ultimate point, energy efficiency, I think is crucial from two perspectives. If we increase in Germany for final domestic consumers cost by 15% due to renewables and increase efficiency by 15%, the final energy bill is the same. 
And I think that's something which we can use upon and I think where we need a lot more focus, for example, on the energy efficiency directive in the parliament at the moment, where I feel a lot of good effort can be taken forward, a lot of commitment at the European level that helps member states to implement things and where I still see far too little attention given to this one uh, relative to our discussions on energy market design. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Karsten. Carlos, the floor is yours. Okay, so <clears throat> first I wanted to thank to the uh, organizers for inv inviting me to this session. And I want to take uh, the opportunity to also to give credit to the EUE and, and particularly the French Club Regulation and the work that Jean-Michel and his crew uh, are making through these last years because I think that they are turning into a great point of of discussion for the necessary re regulatory discussions in Europe. So uh, I want to begin by that. Uh, in Spain, we have a say that it's cada loco con su tema, which is kind of uh, to each his own, or, or literally he, uh, each insane to his own obsessions. So I will talk about a couple of my obsessions. Um, the first one, uh, it's, uh, I will uh, more or less like Jorge will slip in the previous session just to talk a little bit about market integration, in particular in electricity, which is my field. Uh, and in particular, I will talk about capacity markets. Uh, I agree that the evolution of the market integration in Europe is improving. I mean, things are being done better. All the efforts in the price coupling between regions, uh, initiatives, the coordination of balance and markets, uh, capacity allocation constraints and stuff are great moves in the right direction. But at the same time, we are allowing the evolution of regulation to go extremely backwards without doing much. Uh, with, uh, in particular with capacity markets. We have been working on the issue for 15 years, designing capacity markets in more than 10, 10 countries, so I, might, I think that capacity markets are a great solution, particularly in these moments in which there's a huge uncertainty on how the electric power systems are going to look like in the future. Uh, but uh, my concern is that if we take a look at what's going on now, we have a uh, a number of member states that are developing these capacity markets, each one of these designs are completely different. These designs are going to impact the short-term markets heavily, and I don't see that, I fear that the coordination moves that are being launched now are going to be late. Just to mention one, one example, yesterday I was in Paris and they were talking about the French design, which means that no cross-border generating units are going to be allowed to join these capacity markets. So while we're talking about integration, we are designing now new, method, new uh, regulatory schemes that are going to put huge barriers, not for tomorrow, but forever. So I encourage the regulatory institutions in Europe to take charge of this issue. I know that there's a good practice um, on generation adequacy being discussed at the regulatory institutions level. But unfortunately, as we know here in Europe, regulators don't do regulation. It's governments that finally do it. So I encourage my friend Alberto and all the others to take charge of this, of this issue. The other point is more on the renewables policy issue, and in particular one of the issues that, that Mr. Delbecke mentioned in the open issues, which is increasing expenditures of renewables. Uh, recently, after taking, uh, spending some time in the U.S., I usually uh, uh, receive questions on whether the European decision on supporting renewables after all these years was a success or not. I think it's clearly, it has clearly been a success. So it has been a short-term cost that is going to bring us, I'm sure of it, great returns for the future. Uh, just to ha have some examples, uh, now in Brazil or in Peru, places in which we are involved in designing auctions, windmills are coming in at prices around $70 per megawatt hour, which is something that I'm sure that we couldn't believe 10 years ago, or solar PV panels are entering the Chilean market at $120 per megawatt hour, and I th think positively that this has a lot to do with the European effort on renewables. Some things could have been done better, take the solar PV feeding tariff in Spain to have a bad example, but I think that this is a great move. Now my concern is precisely we all know that the, best, the largest menace for the development of renewables is the impact that they have on the electricity tariffs. And I think that we should take special uh, concern 
on trying to mitigate that problem. And we are seeing that situation not only in my country, in Spain, but in many others. So I will just mention two points on that issue. I think that the time for feeding tariffs administratively calculated, just to, um, uh, as Karsten was mentioning before, should be over. I think that is the time some, uh, to design auctions for deciding which are these prices that uh, renewables should uh, be remunerated or these subsidies, first thing. And my second point has to do with uh, burden sharing. It's clear that the development of renewables is being made, particularly in electricity. It's m maybe the most efficient way of achieving one of the 20s targets. But I think that it's important that, that we should uh, try to allocate those costs, not only for, on electricity tariffs, which would be a good thing to avoid all this pressure on those tariffs, but among all the other different uh, energy consumption, gas and, and oil. I think that it's not just a, a proposal that has to do with, if you want, political uh, practical issues, but also uh, it can be demonstrated that it's by far the most efficient way to really pass through the right market signal to all the energy consumers. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. I'll turn, turn to my left. Ronnie Bellman's, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, also, I'm very thankful that I can be part of the discussion. And although I was a bit surprised to be in the climate part, because I'm a grid person, I don't think it was too wrong at the end, because I would like to cite here Livio Gallo, the CEO of Enel Distribuzione, who says, no grids, no party. And I will explain that further on what he means by that. We need grids to party in the climate environment. We need grids for the decarbonization of the energy system. And I tend to disagree on that respect uh, with Karsten, who says that the energy consumption will go down in the future. I can agree with that. But in Europe, the electricity consumption will go up because less energy means more use of electricity because it's the most efficient way to bring all the decarbonized energy to the consumer. So that's one point we have to take very much in, into account. Now, do we need more transmission or do we need more distribution? We just need more. Transmission for long distance, for wheeling power from the northwest to central Europe, from wind, to wheeling power from solar in the south, to the north, I just cannot imagine why it's so important to have PV panels on the roof in Belgium where they all only are cleaned by rain, but that's not a question. But also, and this may be politically totally incorrect what I'm saying, maybe we can wheel nuclear power from Russia to Europe, also a clean source. We need those big grids to tap in into storage, pumped hydro. But pumped hydro in Norway and in the Alps will not be enough. We need power to gas, maybe embedded in offshore wind farms. So we need the big grids, and this is not a European solution. If I look to the United States, I see the development in front of PGM of Atlantic Wind Corporation the so-called Google cable that will connect wind parks and alleviate the grid onshore. Certainly, we have to avoid ostrich politics, where we say we don't have a problem and ignore problems. There are problems in the grid, there have been problems in the beginning of this year, and we have to solve them rather than ignore them. That's about the transmission grid. Distribution grid. We need local elements to balance locally the demand and the supply, to integrate all those small generating units from PV or small micro CHP. We need new 
economical frameworks like virtual power plants and aggregators. The kilowatt hour will not be the unit we sell electricity in, it will be, for instance, flexible demand. How can we arrange that? How can we set up those local markets? How can the grid support all those new elements we need in local storage, in local demand side management? How can we supply the millions of electric vehicles some people are dreaming of? These will all require a lot of investment, certainly in the intelligence of local grids. And for instance, to show you that we will need more electricity with less energy, if we use in efficient buildings heat pumps for heating, we use less energy but more electricity. Very peaky demand, we don't like it, but we love to do it. So what, returning now to the statement of Livio Gallo, no grids, no party, I discussed on that statement with Livio after his speech, uh, and he was very clear on that. If we will have good grids, we can organize a lot of interesting parties to inaugurate PV systems, wind energy systems, electric vehicle uh, lo loading systems, to ignore, to, to inaugurate new smart cities which are carbon free. So if we go for the grids, then we will have a lot of parties to serve what is my right-hand neighbor lo lo look looking at a decarbonized world with a lot of grids and a lot of parties. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Comment from our final panelist, Simon Blakey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me add my thanks to the organizers, the EUI, for putting on such a splendid conference and for inviting me to at least close this panel by offering a perspective from the natural gas industry on the climate change question. I'm very pleased that the two speakers who opened the session, Carlo Carrera and Jostel Becker, started with facts. Carlo drew our attention to the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, to the very high levels that we've already reached, and to the fact that they continue to accelerate at an unacceptable rate. And Joss drew our attention to, I think, what Europe has achieved on this small step that we needed to make uh, with the Kyoto commitments. I think the two highlights that I draw from the facts that each of them brought to our attention, from Carlo's point of view, very high levels of concentration, increasing too fast still, I think we would all agree that in terms of achieving results, anything that we can achieve quicker and sooner is better than anything that we achieve later and more slowly. That's one starting point. From Joss, what has Europe achieved? Well, he showed a very interesting chart right at the beginning of the very first green dotted line, which I think was showing the reductions between 1990 and 2008, which is when the last official data is there. If you looked closely at that chart, you'd see that more was achieved between 1990 and 2000 than between 2000 and 2008. And what I'd really like to do is draw your attention when you look in the details at why we achieved what we've achieved in Europe. Um, it gives us some very, there's some very interesting evidence which gives us some clues for what are right and constructive policies going forward. There's a, um, a very good publication by the European Environment Agency which uh, looks at greenhouse gas emission trends in Europe, uh, tracking progress towards Kyoto and the 2020 targets. When we look at that and when we look at the greenhouse gas inventory reports from the Commission to the UNFCCC, it's very clear that as far as energy-related emissions are concerned, there are two big contributors on a sustainable basis to lower emissions in Europe. One is those countries which have substituted natural gas in high-efficiency equipment for old-fashioned simple steam turbines. They have been big winners. The others are those who have closed old-fashioned energy industries in formerly centrally planned economies, East Germany 
and the 12 newer members of the EU. Uh, of the EU. Nothing else in the energy world is comparable to these two facts in terms of what has been achieved. And these are long-run sustainable deliverables. Now, the recession of 2009 caused, broadly speaking, a similar reduction to each of those. But we don't want to repeat that recession. That's the energy part of the story. Of course, many other countries, many countries in the EU have reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions by other measures, by, by non-energy measures. We've seen significant improvements due to waste and landfill management, reduced numbers of livestock, changed industrial processes. These are, these are big contributors. It's not just energy. I see Joss is nodding. The chairman might be nodding as well, because if I can do a bit of publicity for him too, a publication that's just been produced by the EUI, there's an article in it by our chairman which is entitled, Is Conflating Climate with Energy Policy a Good Idea? I commend it to you. It's a very good article. And the point, of course, there are many points in it, but one of them is that it's not just energy that brings us greenhouse gas reductions. But what lessons can we learn for energy policy from the evidence of what has happened so far? I think well, the lesson that I draw, and I was listening very carefully to Claude Mondil's comments on technology, before the break into Philip Lowe's comments on the importance of making sure that whatever technologies come in are competitive and can work on a market basis. When we look beyond 10 years from now, we don't really know what technologies are going to be the winners in terms of greenhouse gas reduction. And our policies today should be designed to make sure that whatever they are, whether it's much lower cost zero carbon renewables, or whether it's CCS that can be rolled out on a broad scale. Whatever they are, we want to make sure that our energy economy is adaptable to be able to deliver on the winning technologies. And we can't guess it in advance. Now, we've said that our, we have three no-regrets options, energy efficiency, carbon pricing, and renewables. I would strongly suggest to you that there is a fourth no-regret option. We know we can get quick wins in carbon reduction by substituting high-efficiency natural gas equipment for lower-efficiency, higher-carbon fuels now, today, tomorrow, quickly, relatively easily. And there's plenty of scope. We still have uh, more than half of fuel used in public uh, electricity generation in Europe uh, based on coal. If we go down that route today for immediate wins, it opens up the, op the options for tomorrow, whether it's CCS on base load with gas or whether it's gas in backup for zero carbon renewables. Those are choices that we will have as a result of investment decisions that can be made today that give us immediate wins today. And that, to me, quick wins today, open options for tomorrow, is a serious fourth no-regret option. Thank you. Thank you very much. Simon. Okay, before opening the floor to the audience and, and to your questions, I'd like to sort of, Simon posed at least implicit questions to each of our speakers, and before opening it, I'd like to broaden that to any comments that either, the, either of the main speakers would have on the comments that have been made uh, so far. Carlo? I don't have uh, specific comments on uh, what uh, we have received. I mean, it's, it were more or less uh, compliments to the two introductions that were quite useful to understand the different uh, issues, varieties. I think that uh, Joss, at the end of his uh, uh, presentation, raised a few questions, and I think that those questions in particular, if this conference want, wants to be useful for the European Union, should be probably addressed either by the panelists or by, by the audience. And uh, these are important questions for the Commission, and I, I believe that, that some answer should come out. Joss, do you have anything to add before we open to the audience? Well, I was struck with one element that came through all the speeches that I've heard uh, this morning, and that is that we need more investment, and in particular in grids because that may become the limiting factor for reaping the benefits of the internal market, but also uh, blocking possibly uh, the further growth in the renewables. And I think that's a very important uh, point that I certainly take with me. Thank you. 
Okay, so we're now open to questions from the audience. Uh, yes, the gentleman in the front. Let's see, where do we have the microphones? Oh, okay. Yes, Fernand Felsinger, I'm the president of IFIAC Europe, the Industrial Consumer Association. Uh, first, I will, uh, my questions go mainly to, to Joss. <laughs> and the first one is, well, first, why are you dissatisfied? Aren't you such type of father which is always thinks his child is not achieving enough? Actually, we should be happy with the ETS system. The fact that the CO2 price is low means that Europe will, without any difficulty, meet the 20% reduction target. And uh, actually, I refer to Denis' initial comment, we should be proud about what Europe has achieved. Second point is you say, well, we need to, we didn't want to act directly on the CO2 price, but we want to make the price increase by set aside mechanisms, which actually, according to the directive, do not automatically lead to a price increase. But actually what you mean is, we still want to make the price increase, but in a subtle way, in a, in a way. Do you think that my colleagues of IECA, I mean the US big industrial consumers, won't use this argument to say, look, ETS is not working. Europe is going to achieve its target, but actually they change the mechanism, they make the price artificially increase, and it's just a way to raise taxes. This, as you know, has very big consequences on the US policy. Other question, if you want to increase prices, to which level? To 350 euro per ton of CO2, which is the level which is required to justify an offshore uh, deep sea wind farm? Or even to much more, because actually a wind farm is not supplying electricity when you need it, so you need complementary investments in backup production, maybe gas-fired power plants, or uh, storage, but in anything, what it means that it will cost much more. Is this just a pure criticism of industrial energy consumers who don't care about climate change? This is not at all the case. But what we think is that the answer is in your last slide. We have a target of greenhouse gases reduction. And by the way, to react to Simon's remark, carbon pricing is not a non-regret option. When I read the 2050 roadmap, which is very instructive, I see that energy efficiency and renewables are not regret, non-regret options, not carbon pricing. So the, the, what should we do, actually? The thing is, we, must, we have a target and we have tools. The tools are energy efficiency, renewables, etc. What we need is to use the most efficient tools at the right moment. Today, if I refer to the CER conference in January 25th, the Austrian regulator said, we can achieve CO2 reductions by, with investments which cost six to eight euro per ton of CO2 saved. That's my last okay. point. Okay. <laughs> uh, why don't we use much more the energy, energy efficiency lever now and let's say, slow down the renewables development policy, which is much more costly at, and requires a more in-depth analysis regarding backup, security of supply, etc. Thank you. Okay. Joss? I think that's directed more at you. Than... Well, um, a few elements. Um, the Commission has no preset idea on any target price. Um, that's why the Commission has been very reluctant to open a, a debate on what to do with the current market prices. But I think that there is a very different analysis between the price reduction and the cyclical movement we saw in the prices uh, following the uh, crisis of 2007-2009 and what we see now uh, since 2011. That is that 2007-2009 may belong to the normal cyclical movement. If there is less economic activity, there is less demand for carbon allowances, etc. 
I think, uh, and the analysis is, uh, is going on, not only in the Commission but elsewhere, I think that there is a consensus growing that we are today faced up with prices that are not leading the investment pattern towards the long-term trajectory that we want to have, that our heads of state have agreed in 2050, we want to be at minus 85%. So that's why the combining the analysis with the long-term part, I think, is essential. And uh, I, I hear from lots of players in the industrial field and the energy field that we need to have price incentives which are neutral towards the technology, but drive into the market those technologies that are going to bring us back on that long-term trajectory. I would like to note, however, that for the um, uh, market uh, intervention uh, related to the, to the, the backloading of auctioned allowances. It is only about auctioning. It is not about the free allocation that is going to be attributed to industrial users as was agreed according to benchmarks. So in that sense, for them, uh, the operation is going to be neutral. And I think that's a very important element when it comes to the carbon leakage debate. Thank you. We have another question on this side, microphone. To... Short, brief questions, please. I will, I will be briefer in any way. Um, here's the block. I'm Secretary General of CEDEC, is European Federation of Local and Regional Energy Companies, and would like to um, give a short reaction on uh, the keynote statement of Mr. Carraro. Um, who said, who pointed out some essential elements of EU climate policy on raising energy efficiency, long-term shifting to renewables and higher investments in energy and residential sectors. Um, the first point is the EU climate ambitions are necessary but ambitious on energy efficiency and on renewables and realizing them uh, is not possible without the support of convinced citizens. That's the first point. The second is a large majority of the renewables will be decentral. This means connected to distribution systems. Third point, 90% of investments in grid infrastructure are in the distribution systems. I come to my point. Local and regional authorities are and will be playing a crucial role for the citizens' involvement and for local investments and permits, for example. It means there are thousands of local and regional energy companies in Europe and they will have to play a crucial role in the future decentralized energy system. And this then of course means that all the players, the big and the small, who are willing and able to contribute should be around the table when developing the future framework to contribute to green growth, to long-term climate policy, and to a competitive uh, energy market. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question here, then I will to uh, William Dassler right there. Yeah, William Dassler, University of Leuven, university professor. Um, I have a comment and I would like to go beyond uh, 2020, so I want to go to 2030, 2040, because you have shown the long-term map. And uh, as a researcher, I would like to encourage the Commission to spend much, much more time on systems analysis and interaction of the different systems. The reason is, and I would like to, to comment on that, the reason is that, well, go that good meant measures, they might interact, okay, in the long run, and that they might actually hamper the transition or that we don't understand what's going on. One example is the one that always was, or that was raised by some time ago by David Newberry, the interaction of the renewables policy, pushing in so many renewables into the system, lowering the carbon price. I know that that has been overshadowed by the crisis, but it's still nevertheless an issue. But I come up with a different one, and I would like to comment, uh, your comment on it. That's the energy efficiency target. We all say, or we want to have less or fewer energy uh, consumption. Now imagine a world in 2040, 2050, where a huge amount of renewables is in the market with zero marginal cost. So you have done your investment, and once your investment is done, you have um, a sunk cost. So you have huge amounts, and sometimes way too much, electricity at zero cost. 
I think you're going to see, it's not a paradox. I first thought it was a paradox, but a paradox is an apparent contradiction. I think here it is a real contradiction that you're actually going to have to pay people to just consume energy, whatever, and in Denmark they are starting to heat up water with that. So where are we with our energy efficiency targets? Uh, shouldn't we think about that a little bit in a different sense? Uh, um, it's, it's one of the issues that indeed energy efficiency and uh, marginal cost pricing and these things, I think they're control I'm not blaming anybody, I'm just raising the issue, throwing it in the field and say that we need to start thinking about these issues because combining all these, these three targets is not going to be very easy. And I would like somebody from the Commission or somebody else oh. to comment on it, please. Thank you. Anyone from the panel want to take on, answer comments on this issue? Joss, here. Well, that was one of the questions I wanted to raise at the end of my intervention. That is that targets have been extremely useful to get at the point of where we are and where we are likely going to be in 2020. That means a target for greenhouse gas emissions, for renewables and for energy efficiency. Um, then we will have to assess what kind of targets we need for the next step. And that is what is on the table. Do we need um, targets on equal footing? If we do that, we will have to determine them at the same time, like we did in the carbon and energy uh, package two years ago, where we knew that for greenhouse gas emissions and for the ETS market, there is an impact on what you do on the renewables. But as we decided on those two targets at the same time, we could uh, uh, calibrate the two, uh, the two objectives and into our analysis. So on targets, clear that there is a new debate uh, coming because the uh, renewable energy will have come out of its uh, very small market percentages to a normal player on the electricity market. That changes the debate and that changes also the functioning for uh, the carbon market. And I think that's the issue we all have to reflect on because there are many direct and indirect ways where one and the other is playing out. And I think that's a reflection we have to have and I would uh, invite the Florence Institute to take that question on. Where do, we go with, where do we go with different targets and how do we optimize also the instruments leading towards the delivery of the different targets? A question that we will have to address not today after tomorrow, but perhaps already tomorrow when uh, we go into more long-term reflections on how to deal with the new gas situation, the new nuclear situation and the new competition on, on the renewable technology coming from the emerging economies. I think these are true three essential elements we have to incorporate in a two-hour analysis. Carlos, you wanted to make a brief comment? Yes. 30 seconds on the comment on the zero prices. Zero prices in electricity markets are not new. You go to Brazil and you will have zero price for 80% of the time. And there's a market that it works. The problem that we might have is that we don't let the market work. So the expectation would be that we will have zero prices lots of hours, but we will have 1,000 euro prices sometimes. So. If we allow the market to work and we let or we pass through these prices to demand, I don't think this should be a problem. It's just a question of right hedging and maybe in the initial push, these capacity markets might help not to cope with short-term volatility, which, it, which is not by any means a problem, but to cope with this uncertainty on how these markets would look like. But I don't think that, that, that there's an issue on, on this zero pricing thing. That's all. We have two more comments from the panel. First, uh, Karsten, and then Simon, and we'll come to a close. Karsten? Following up on this, sorry, following up on this zero pricing, to some extent, I, I build on Carlos' argument that ultimately, as we have more potentially differences, then it's more valuable to invest into storage, which then brings the prices closer together. I think I'll be interested to see how we'll have close interaction with other markets, with fuel markets, where you can have electric heating, as you pointed out, at certain instances and with a very cheap system, um, at other instances with um, biomass, and have the interactions there. We'll have the interactions with a transport system. And I think we have the interactions between European countries. And all of them, I think, need some commercial basis such that you have some anticipation what is going to be the value of providing or demanding the electricity in the future. So I actually think we'll have even more emphasis on the energy price reflecting the full value of energy that is provided. And 
that is probably at some point going to imply that the feed-in tariffs will at least be altered to the way that TSOs or whoever is the counterparty can spill wind as the price goes to zero and might continue to reward so as to kind of ensure financing is facilitated in the future. Um, on the one point in terms of local engagement, I think that's a crucial part ultimately. I think there are two components that can enhance the credibility of the investment framework. One is linking up to this European scale, linking up to other partners that look at each other and support each other, and the other one is having a big support in the public. And I guess in Germany the example of a set of municipalities was quite imp impressive because they were the ones that were taking for the first renewable projects, and I think we have to build on these initiatives and kind of strengthen their back in the future. Thank you. Simon? Thank you, yes. I think from the policy point of view, Joss gave the right answer to this question. Um, you raised the apparent paradox of zero marginal cost pricing, but high cost renewables, how does this work out? Of course, it's true, zero marginal cost pricing doesn't mean that the consumer gets free electricity. Uh, he or she is having to pay in the capital cost, and that's, uh, that's a burden. Um, Joss gave the right answer from a policy point of view. We can help you when it comes to zero marginal cost pricing from the technological and economic point of view. Ronnie mentioned in passing power to gas. We'll take your zero marginal cost surplus solar and wind 80% of the time if you want. We'll, through hydrolysis, make hydrogen from water. We'll inject it into the natural gas grid. We might blend it with CO2 absorbed from somewhere and give you artificial methane. It's the sort of technology that people are working on that will make the world look different five years, ten years from now than it looks today. Um, and these are things that we should make sure that when we're developing the policies, we don't close off avenues that are very interesting for the future. Thank you. I'm Remind Claude, we moderators stick together. And I was reminded that Claude, you'd like to make an intervention or comment or question or not? We, we grant you time. I, I told you, moderators stick together, so I grant you some time. Thank you very much. No, I wanted to, uh, to mention that uh, the IEA thinks that in the future, uh, one uh, of the important uh, factors to reduce CO2 emissions is capture ca uh, carbon capture and storage. And I have not heard a lot of, uh, about that during this uh, session. Another, uh, another factor I have not heard uh, either is uh, nuclear, but I don't want to speak about nuclear, just to hope that uh, those countries who do their job will not be, uh, will be helped for that. But on carbon capture and storage, uh, my understanding, uh, first I suspect that uh, it could become the marginal tool in the future in, uh, to, to abate CO2. And that means that the marginal cost of CO2 could be the cost of carbon capture and storage. People who work on that tell me that it would be probably around 50 dollars, 50 euros, sorry, per ton of CO2. Does not that mean that uh, we should try to let CO2 price go up, perhaps not in one year, but progressively to this level. Do you want to comment? Go ahead, Joss. Well, on CCS, okay. we, we are very much aware of the issue, and uh, the Commission is openly supporting several projects. But you are right that apart from this temporary support, and the NER 300 is going to be finalized uh, before the end of this year, um, that it is ideally the market, uh, the carbon market price, that should take care of that. Uh, but that is one of the questions that we will have to address also in the perspective of 2030. Um, because there is this issue of the carbon price, which is positive, and there is the carbon leakage uh, element that is on the other side. So it, it depends very much to what extent we can have the whole world in 2015 taking comparable action, because if that is going to happen, then the carbon leakage pressure that is there, uh, that the carbon leakage pressure is not going to increase further. So if that international negotiation could go right, then the perspective of having uh, carbon prices in the range that you are indicating to drive into the market uh, CCS plans could, could be a, a solution indeed. Claude's 
Claude's comments are always provocative and it has provoked three more. I want to emphasize quick comments from the panel before we will definitively close. George. Well, thanks, Danny. Uh, since we are talking about uh, zero uh, cost electricity, I, I would like to recall that uh, the Soviet Union also thought that it would uh, be the case and therefore they did not install electricity meters. I, I would warn against this expectation and I would strongly recommend that you accelerate the implementation of smart metering. And uh, by the way, as it was also said yesterday, <coughs> I think we, we should uh, pass the message to electricity consumers, energy consumers, that energy prices are going to increase. They are not going to decrease and we should all be prepared for that scenario. I think that was very unfortunate when liberalization started that uh, it was announced that uh, electricity prices uh, would go down. They went down for some time when uh, oil prices were at $10, $12 per barrel, but then they went up and by 2003 consumers were very much worried. So we should uh, not uh, make these uh, <coughs> announcements and we should tell consumers the truth that most probably energy prices will go up. Thank you. Quick comment. Ronnie Belmond. Claude, I'm, I'm fully aware of what you're saying. There are two things. First of all, it's carbon capture, transport, and storage. You need a pipeline for it, and that's going to be a very difficult one. But as an electricity person, I'm surprised to see so low interest in CCS on gas, because I like, I don't like coal-fired power, coal -fired power plants, because they are not dynamic enough. I need gas in my system. And therefore, CCS with gas is really of what is interest to me and to your right-hand neighbor. Is he right, Simon? Final comment, quickly. He has a very important, he has a very important point. Uh, the first thing to say about CCS and CCS policy is we mustn't let CCS die. And the challenges that it has faced in the last few years have been very significant. Uh, Philip Lowe mentioned this morning that uh, a world of no subsidies is not a world of no subsidies for RD and D, and CCS is definitely in the area where support is needed for RD and D work. Very much appreciated that the Commission is still engaged. My board at Eurogas has uh, recently insisted that we set up uh, a working group to look specifically at CCS. Uh, we do not historically have heavy engagement in it. People are right to point that out. Uh, it is recognized that if it is not going to die, then something needs to be done both at the policy level and at the industrial level. So, yes, Ronnie has a point. Thank you very much. Before handing the floor over to Jean-Michel to close, let me ask you to join me in thanking our sp remaining speaker and our panelists for their excellent presentations and discussions. Jean-Michel, you can instruct us as what to do next. The most important part of the day.